Well, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's inaugural lecture. My name is Jonathan Mosling. I am Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean of Natural Sciences. And it's a great pleasure for me to, in a moment, in invite Helen Price to come and give her uh, inaugural uh, lecture. This is the first uh, series of inaugural lectures sit that we've held in the faculty since uh, COVID. Um, and this is our first one for natural sciences, and we've got up to an absolutely splendid start, a really buzzing audience, uh, no doubt helped um, not just by the, the wine we've had before, but also with the anticipation of what I know is going to be a really exciting and interesting lecture uh, from Helen. Uh, we're also joined by our online uh, audience, and at the end of the lecture, there'll be a chance to ask questions, uh, hopefully of not too a technical nature this evening, um, but also from our online audience as well. I think it's a facility to do that as well. Uh, before we start, just a, a, a brief word about Helen. This is where uh, the uh, inaugural lecture person, I'm not quite sure what the noun is for that, but whoever you are, uh, 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 Helen, uh, squirms in their seat with embarrassment, but I do have to give a bit of a biography. Um, so Helen graduated with a, uh, a BSc Honours degree in Applied Zoology from the University of Leeds and a PhD in Molecular Parasitology. And uh, I do know Helen's PhD supervisor is here somewhere in the audience because I was talking to her earlier. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then a, um, uh, she, sorry, um, no, that's wrong, isn't it? It's your postdoc supervisor, yes, yeah. Um, you then worked as a researcher at the Institute for Cancer, uh, Cancer Research at Imperial College London and at the University of York, where indeed you worked with Debbie Smith uh, before being appointed in your first academic position at Keele in 2013. Um, so Helen's research, we're going to hear a little bit about this evening, um, focuses on a neglected skin disease, cutaneous leishmaniasis, which is caused by an infection from the parasite leishmania. Her, um, since her appointment at Keel, Helen has been awarded over £6 million worth of external grant funding, and her lab-based research focuses on the cell biology of the parasite and the development of novel treatments using magnetic na nanotechnology and natural products. Uh, Helen also co-leads the Eclipse program with medical anthropologist Professor Lisa Decomitus, um, uh, who's now at the University of Kent but was here at, at Keele previously. So Eclipse, which I know we're going to hear a little bit about this evening as well, is a five-year NIHR-funded interdisciplinary applied healthcare programme with a team of over 60 researchers across four continents, which aims to reduce stigma and improve the patient journey for people living with cutaneous leishmaniasis. Helen's had a number of leadership roles at Keele, including a role, roles in leading postgraduate in the faculty and also in, uh, as research lead in, in the School of Life Sciences. I think one of the things I'm really looking forward to, I, I have to confess a little vested interest because I'm a parasitologist myself, I'm interested in protozoan parasites, and I know one of the most interesting things about protozoan parasites is their very close interaction uh, with, their, with their host. Um, I think something that really stands out with Helen's work is to, her, to understand how actually that disease interacts with that wider level of society and healthcare in general, and I think that's a really fascinating area that she's going to uh, take us on, along that bit of that journey this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Helen Price to come and deliver your inaugural lecture. Great. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, thank you to the people joining us online as well. Um, and I'm going to take you on a, a journey um, from cell biology to magnets to um, looking at the wider effects of diseases. So there is a little bit of science, um, but I'll, I'll try to go easy and, uh, and talk you through it. So starting from the, the early years, so you always have to have a, an embarrassing photograph in an inaugural lecture. Um, so the, the first photo is um, the start and the end of my singing career. 
which was at um, Pontins in the early 1970s. Um, next photo is with my dad, who sadly is, is not with us anymore. Um, and then uh, the, the last one is um, me in the 1980s with the uh, compulsory perm. So I was, um, I was brought up in the West Midlands um, with my mum and dad and my three sisters. And we do have a, a family connection with Kiel. Um, my aunt, Eileen Flynn, was the matron of the health centre from 1968 to 1971. Um, and she had a, a dog, um, Caesar, who was really well known in the area because he used to escape and um, steal food from Horwood Flats. <laughs> so, so that was my, uh, my slightly tenuous link to, to Kiel from the past. So um, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a vet, um, but I then changed to um, going into biology. And I did my first degree at Leeds, um, and I was introduced to parasites by two really inspiring lecturers, Donald Lee and Judith Smith. And it, it was something that really grabbed me from the, from the beginning. And this is a if you can see here, this is a, a helminth parasite, a worm, called trichinella. It was the first parasite that I worked on. And you get it from eating um, raw pork, and it goes into the cells, it goes into the muscle cells, and it changes the biology of that cell so that it can survive. And I thought that was amazing, and um, it's, the rest is history. So, so from Leeds... I moved to Bangor. Um, I did a PhD on a, another worm infection on schistosomiasis. Um, and this is a worm that um, it lives in infected water and it has a, a protein that it uses to get through human skin. And that's how it's transmitted. And the, um, the aim of my PhD was to see whether this protein was good as a, as a vaccine. So I did lots of work on that. Um, it completely failed. It was not a good vaccine. Um, but it helped me to, um, to become a parasitologist and to learn lots of skills in the lab. So I moved from there to the Institute for Cancer Research in London. Um, and I learned lots of skills there. I was working on lymphoma on a very um, genetic-based project but I really missed the parasites, um, which sounds very strange, but it was, <laughs> it was, uh, it was something that I, I really wanted to do. And I moved from there to um, Imperial College London, where I joined um, Debbie Smith's group. So Debbie is here in the audience um, and was a really great um, role model for me. So thank you, Debbie. And that's probably really embarrassed her. Um, so I... I started to work then on um, not a worm, but a single-celled parasite leishmania, which is this one here. And I'll tell you a, a lot more about that in a moment. And some related parasites, trypanosomes, which are, which are here. And that was really my, my niche. So this is the type of information that I would teach to our, um, to our students in a, in a parasitology lecturer. So leishmaniasis is um, it's caused by a tiny parasite, leishmania, and it's spread by the bite of a, a sand fly. And it goes into the skin, and then it's in, it invades white blood cells called macrophages. So this is a, um, a sample from a, an infected person. And you can see this is the white blood cell. And these little dots here are the parasites. So if you were diagnosing this disease, you would have to look for those little dots. Um, so that's, it's, it's a very skilled job to do that. Um, and there are one to two million new cases of the disease every year. But if you think about, about that last statistic, we use statistics all the time but we don't really think about what that actually means. And that's a huge number of people. 
who will be affected by this disease. So later in my talk, I'll, I'll um, describe work that we're doing to think about what the disease does to communities and to individuals. And looking from a, a human perspective, Leishmaniasis is a, a disease that's very closely linked to extreme poverty. It's found in areas of conflict. Um, it's common in, um, in areas where there's been population displacement. Here we've got a, a photo of a, a refugee camp. So one of the forms of leishmaniasis is very common, um, particularly in the Middle East, around the areas of the, the Syrian um, conflict. And it's very difficult to treat. We have only a handful of really toxic drugs, and we don't have a vaccine. So leishmaniasis in the past has been really neglected, um, both from the public health perspective, but also um, from research as well. And there's a lot that we don't know about the parasite and about the disease as a whole. So unusually for um, a parasite, you have three different types of the disease, and that depends on the species of leishmania which you're infected with. So we have the cutaneous form, which is when the parasites stay in the skin, um, and they cause a, a skin lesion. So this is the, the first type of CL. Then this can uh, develop later on into a, a mucocutaneous form, which is when the parasites go to the mucous membranes. And this can cause really bad damage, particularly around the, um, the nose and the throat. And then you have the, the most severe form, which is when the parasites go to the liver and the spleen. And this is um, it's usually fatal unless it's treated. So I'm just going to have a quick drink. So there's an urgent need for new drugs um, to treat leishmaniasis cases, not just the, uh, the visceral, but also the, the cutaneous forms. So where do you start? And this is where there's a bit of science, but I'll, I'll try to be nice to the audience. So, um, so just to start, um, you need to know what a, a compound library is. So a compound library is a, a set of chemicals um, that have been collected together. The, chem the, the compounds could be made by chemists in the lab. Um, they could be extracted from natural sources such as plants or algae or seaweed or something like that. So you've got this big collection of compounds together. And you want to find out which of those will kill your parasite in the lab. And that's your first point. So there's two different approaches that you can take. You can take the phenotypic screening, which is the most simple. So you basically take your, your parasites, you add a compound to it, and then you check if it's dead. So this is the really, the, the really simple way. This is how a lot of drugs in the past have been developed. Um, but you don't know what that compound is doing. So you then have to go backwards and do a lot more investigation in order to optimise it. But the other way that you can do is target-based approach. So that's when you've studied the biology of the parasite in a lot of detail, and you decide on a, a particular protein or a, a, a particular molecule that the parasite needs in order to survive. And then you add the test compound to that protein, you look for something that stops the function of that protein, and then you check if it kills the parasite. So this is a much longer process, but then you know what you're dealing with, or you, you think you know what you're dealing with. It's, it's not perfect. It's longer, but you can also do computer modeling. So you can, you can look at a protein, and you can model something that you think will block it. So these two are, uh, these are quite important to know what I was doing a bit later on. But finding a compound that kills the parasite is only like it's here. It's a really small part at the beginning of a really long process.
process. You've got all of these different steps that you then need to go through. And the vast majority of compounds will never get to this point where you've got your, your phase one trials, which is when you have to first make the jump into putting that compound into a person. So you have to have a, um, a multidisciplinary team, each of them working on a different part of that process in order to get right to the end where you've got a drug. And it also uses a huge amount of money, as you can imagine. So one thing that we can do is to, to look at what's been done before and use resources from other species and other diseases. And that's what we did um, with um, a big project um, in Debbie's lab while I was there. So you don't need to think very much about the long name of the, of the protein, just to know that it's a protein that's found in Leishmania. And it had been studied before as a, a drug target in fungi. So we had lots of resources available. We, there was lots of information about it. So I did some genetic work to show that in Leishmania, if the parasites didn't have it, then they would die. So we then went to um, Dundee and to, to Pfizer, and they, they screened hundreds of thousands of compounds, and you know what they are now. And um, they found some that were really active, and they, they killed the parasites. So um, we established a, a, a big... NMT consortium. Um, we found some compounds that they didn't kill Leishmania, but they did kill uh, related parasites. So we had a, um, a paper in Nature that described this work. But then if you think of the big pipeline, these compounds failed a little bit further down that pipeline. But the, um, the work that we did is still ongoing in, in some of the labs, and the inhibitors are now being looked at as um, uh, anti-cancer or potential anti-cancer drugs. So it's kind of gone round in a, in a circle where we've, we've looked at something for fungi, we've gone via the, the parasites, but now we've got to cancer. So then in 2013, I relocated to Kiel. It's beautiful campus, really nice place to, um, to bring up a, a child. So I relocated here with my husband, and, and this is Edward, who's squirming at the front of the, the lecture theatre. This was Ed at a, um, an outreach event that we did, so he was my helper. Um, and I set up a, a lab um, at Kiel, working on Lishmania, and I started collaborations. So I had some MRC funding with um, Sarah Hart to, to work on some Leishmania biology. Um, and Sarah Berry and Liz King have worked on that project, and they're, they're all here today, which is really nice. And um, some drug discovery work with Paul Horrocks, who's also here. And I had a, a steep learning curve of having to, to learn to teach and having to appreciate that students don't love parasites as much as I do. <laughs> and a squirrel, lots of squirrels. Um, so we, we had lots of squirrels. So looking back at these, um, the other type of screening, so we did some, some work in the lab with, for the phenotypic screening. So that's when you just take loads of compounds, you throw them at the parasites and see if any of them will... Um, will kill them. It's a bit more complicated than that, but um, so we, we had a, a paper that came out looking at um, compounds that were from plants grown in temperate zones, so things like daffodils and leeks and Christmas trees. And we did find some that were active. The ones that were active against all the parasites tended to also be really toxic to human cells. Um, and they were the ones that we really didn't want. So we did find some leads. And I had a bit of a, a detour at this point. I know some of you all know that I, I at one point, I worked on camels. Um, so we were working on a camel 
parasite called Chipanosoma evansi. So we did a, a screen on this parasite. And that was in collaboration with um, Professor Samaya Abu Akadir at Alexandria University in Egypt. And it was a, a chance encounter. Um, Samaya came to my lab for six months. And um, we, did, we did some nice work on the, um, on the, the drug screening. But I think the, the best part of the, the grant that we, that we were awarded between Keel and Alexandria was the capacity building. So we set up, um, we set up a, um, a lab. It's this one here. So that's a bit of it. It was a bit of a detour. Um, and then from these parasites, I had to decide which of these was I going to focus on the most. Um, and I decided to work on cutaneous leishmaniasis. This was really an area that was unexplored and very few people were working on it. So why should we work on CL? Because it's just skin. Um, over 75% of the leishmaniasis cases are CL. And although it doesn't kill the person who has it, it can be disfiguring, it can be very stigmatizing, or so it was described in the literature. There wasn't really very much information about that. And unlike um, visceral leishmaniasis, the number of cases of CL have increased and the distribution has increased over the last couple of decades. So it's found in about 90 countries worldwide. It's found across um, parts of um, South America, particularly in Brazil and Peru. Um, it's found in um, parts of Africa, um, in the Middle East, um, in some parts of Asia, and also in, in um, southern parts of Europe. So there was a statistic a few years ago that about a third of the dogs in southern Spain have leishmaniasis. And CL, um, at the moment, the treatments are really bad. So you've got a choice. You can have no treatment because the lesions will eventually heal. It could take months. It could take over a year. And if you've got something that looks like this that's on your face, that's really not a great option. Um, you can have multiple daily injections with a drug that's based on antimony, which is really toxic. And that's the treatment that's, um, that's really universal across lots of regions. But you can also use physical methods. So the parasites are really, um, they're really sensitive to changes in heat. So you can use either cryotherapy, where you freeze the lesion, or you can use thermotherapy, where you heat the lesion up. And this is a, a machine that was developed for, um, for thermotherapy for CL. So you use something that looks a bit like a tuning fork, and you put that all over the lesion. And it heats it up to 50 degrees. So there is a risk of um, second-degree burns, and it's also um, really painful. So it's not ideal. And the problem is that the parasites are down in the dermis. They're not in the top layer of the skin. So you're really you're putting the heat in a different place to where you want it to be. So could we make it more specific? So another chance encounter um, I had with um, Neil Telling and Claire Hoskins, um, physicist and a, a chemist. And we started um, a, a pilot study that was funded by the Wellcome Trust to look to see if we could use um, nanoparticles or tiny magnets to make heat that will put um, that will go into the, the right place for the parasites. So the idea is that you would take these nanoparticles, these tiny, ti they're like tiny magnets. You would inject them into a lesion, and then you'd add um, an alternating magnetic field, and the, par the, uh, not the parasites, the nanoparticles, um, they magnetize and then they relax and they produce heat. So all you need to know really is that these tiny things, they go inside the cells and they produce heat. So it's really focused. 
and it's inducible, so you can switch it on and off, and you can fine-tune it as well, so depending on the, um, the magnetic field, you can increase or decrease the, the heating effect. So um, I, I'd heard Neil and Claire talking about this technology for, as, as potential anti-cancer therapies, and I thought this would work really well for, for leash mania, so it was quite exciting. So we started, um, and the work I'm showing was done by Sarah Berry, and this slide is the, I think it's the, the culmination of a lot of work, um, like months, months of, of optimization. So we took some, um, we took some parasites, um, we grew them up on um, little sheets, and um, we had white blood cells, the parasites, and we put the nanoparticles in as well, put them into the machine, um, added the, the magnetic field, and it works. So, um, so we found that the, the parasites were killed by this treatment. So this is the bit here that you need to look at. So this is where you have the, the magnetic nanoparticles and the alternating magnetic field together. Whereas the white blood cells that the parasites are in are not killed by this treatment. So, um, so we're selectively killing the parasites and not the white blood cells. So this is a, um, it's a project I'd really like to, to take further. Um, and we're looking for, for ways to, to fund this so that we can move on to the next steps. So in the lab, this works, but we would need to to really expand this a lot. So that's just a, a glimpse into some of the, um, the work that I've done for, um, for on the parasite side. But we have lots of knowledge gaps for CL. And there's a new roadmap that the WHO published um, where they, they have targets for 2021 to 2030. And we've made a lot of progress because in the, uh, in the previous roadmap, CL was not even included at all. Um, so we have a target of 85% of cases detected and 95% of those treated. But we have a lot of problems. There are a lot of things that we don't know. We don't know how many people have CL. Um, we don't know where they go to seek healthcare or when. We don't know if people are aware of what CL is in, um, in infected regions. We don't know who's most affected. We don't know what the effects are be beyond the lesion pathology because as parasitologists, we look at the lesion, we don't look at the person. Um, CL is described as being stigmatizing, but there are very few studies that have been done on actually what the effects are, and no one has tried to address it. So there's loads of things that we don't know. So in 2018, um, I had a, a huge change of direction um, in my research, so another chance encounter, I had a lot of those. Uh, so I met uh, Lisa de Committis, a medical anthropologist, and, um, and we started to discuss um, potential work that we, could, that we could do together, maybe a, a small project that we, could, that we could do. Around about that time, there was a, um, a new funding call that came out um, for work on stigmatizing skin conditions, and we thought this would be perfect. And we got... Um, we had people interested from Brazil and Sri Lanka, and we put in the first stage, and we got through the first stage, and then they gave us some travel money, and we cold called some people in Ethiopia because we wanted someone in, um, in East Africa. East Africa is really an area where we think there is a lot of CL, but very little is, is really known. So we had a, a mad trip to, to Ethiopia. Um, it was about two weeks before the grant application was due. Um, and we, 
we turned up and we were still writing the grant at this point. Um, we went out um, and looked at um, potential field sites. We completely rewrote what we'd written. Um, we gate crashed a wedding and, um, and then we, um, we wrote loads of the application while we were there. Um, I think we, we took it in turns to sleep. <laughs> And um, I was so tired at one point that I, I dropped a teapot down a, a set of marble stairs in the hotel. Um, but we got the grant application in, um, and then we got the money. So they gave us, they gave us four and a half million pounds to, um, to set up a big study to look at the, the wider effects of CL across three different sites. So that was just amazing. Um, so Eclipse was born, so it's a very long title. Um, it was the first grant I had that had an acronym and also um, empowering in the title, which is great. So the full title is Empowering People with Cutaneous Leishmaniasis, Intervention Programme to Improve Patient Journey and Reduce Stigma via Community Education. So we have a, um, a big um, team, but we have country leads in each of the, the sites. So we have uh, myself and Lisa are the, the co-leads. And then in Brazil, we have Lenny Trad, who's an anthropologist, and Paolo Machado, who's a dermatologist. In Ethiopia, we have um, Afuwerk uh, Mulugeta here. And then in Sri Lanka, we have uh, Suneth Agamposi and Talini. Agampoti as the leads. And we have a, a really big team. This is just, these are some photos of a, a few of the teams. So we've got Brazil, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, and the UK. And uh, we've got new people in the UK as well. And I need better, I need more photographs. Um, and we, we decided on the different countries for different reasons. So Brazil, um, Seattle is, we believed was really well known in Brazil. There's treatments available. We assumed that um, the disease um, was well known by the, the communities. And we had a collaboration with uh, a Leishmaniasis Reference Centre, which was a, a clinic that was just for treating CL. And that was our centre of excellence. Then in Ethiopia, we believed that there was a lot of CL but there was very little data on that, and there was very little awareness in the communities. And Sri Lanka um, was believed to be, um, it, CL was believed to be a, an emerging disease, and I'll come back to that um, a bit later. So the aims um, are very broad, um, to explore and improve the psychosocial aspects associated with CL, look at stigma and its effects in the patient journey. So what happens when people first become infected? Do they go to a healthcare centre? Um, do they self-treat? Um, do they delay going for treatment? What, what happens? And nobody really has looked at this in any detail before. So we had three um, phases, so exploring CL in communities. So this is... Um, uh, ethnography, so sending um, researchers out to, to live in field sites for several months so they can observe and see what happens um, and to, to build relationships up with communities. Um, interviews, focus groups, um, and lots of, lots of different methods. And then based on the challenges that we would find we would develop interventions and then evaluate those to see if they'd made a difference. And running through this is um, community engagement and involvement. So this was really the first time I'd been involved in a project that asked people what they wanted. Um, so we have two different types of community groups. We have the um, community advisory groups, which are based um, at the village level. And this is lots of different people who work in the, in, work, live in the, the field sites, and they um, help us to 
design the research so that it's appropriate for that situation. So if we're, if we're doing an interview, for example, we won't necessarily ask the same questions in Brazil as we do in Ethiopia because they're different places and the questions might not make sense in one, uh, in one of those places. And um, we also have communities of practice which are at regional level and there we have policy makers, academics, health care professionals and they can be um, involved in the project from the beginning but also help with sustainability and policy change at the end. And it was also the first time, actually, this was, this was when we went to, to Brazil on our first visit. This is me here. Um, and this was in the um, Leishmaniasis Reference Centre. It's the first time I'd actually seen anyone with Leishmaniasis. And I'd been working on the disease for about 20 years. So I was really disconnected from, from the disease I was working on. So we had a few external challenges. So um, we, started the, we started the grant um, the end of 2019. This is our Gantt chart, which we made at Addis Ababa Airport <laughs> in the middle of the night. Um, it's probably the biggest Gantt chart I've ever made. Um, we have a list of 175 milestones, so it's a big project. And this is me in Salvador in Brazil. It was exactly three years ago, 14th of March 2020. Um, we flew back to the UK that evening. And I think three days later, the world went into lockdown. Um, so we'd all just started, we'd just started recruiting the team across the, the other countries. Um, and we had to switch everything online. So we, we got to know our, our partners and our, our teams. And we were, we were running research from a, from a, a long distance. Um, we also had the um, conflict. So we were working in um, Tigray in Ethiopia. And there was a, quite a brutal conflict that started at, in November 2020. Um, there was a peace process that was started um, two years later. And there was a blockade um, for a year from um, 2021. So there's been a, a dire lack of essential supplies, so food, medical supplies, um, really everything, fuel, cash, wasn't able to, to be taken into, into the region. And there was targeted destruction of the healthcare services, so pretty much the healthcare system collapsed in, in Tigray. So there was no treatment of CL, uh, but there was really no treatment for, for anything. Um, so it's caused a huge numbers of, of deaths. It's thought that about 10% of the population of Tigray died during the, the conflict. And it's really not been reported very much in the news. So um, the team in, in Tigray amazingly carried on working. Um, and when they could, they went out into the, into the fields. They did ethnography. Um, and they found quite a, really the what was happening on the ground was really a stark contrast to what we have in the lab. So we, we do all these very well-controlled and sterile experiments looking at drugs that could kill the parasite. In Tigray, the um, CL is um, it's very rarely formally diagnosed or treated. And the problem is that everything is, is so far removed. So you've got the, the primary healthcare level, you've got your local health posts, which is where people would first go. Um, and there was a very low awareness of what CL was. You would then need to go to the secondary level, to the hospitals, and then to the tertiary level, the, the referral hospitals, in order to get a formal diagnosis and then treatment. And the treatment is injections every day for 20 days. If 
If you don't have somewhere to stay in the city, it could be four hours drive away from where you live. It's just not a, a viable option. So the, the overwhelming response that people got was, this disease is untreatable, because they were going to the, to the health posts and they were being told, there's nothing we can do about it. And there was, there was a, a local name for the lesions. People knew what it was, but they didn't know what it was caused by. And it was assumed that there was no treatment. So instead, and here you've got really quite severe lesions because they're not being treated um, with the drugs. So instead, um, people are using traditional treatments. So a range of, of quite... Um, quite different things. So salt and garlic and lentils, um, urea, um, herbs, holy water, and then in some areas burning. So the local priests would burn the, the lesions with a hot wire. And um, the stigma associated with CL, particularly in Ethiopia, is very, um, we found it was very severe. Uh, so these are just a few quotes. I think this one down at the bottom is, is really quite powerful that um, this person said they, were, they felt they were created twice, so in their life before they had CL and their life afterwards, and it had that much of an impact on them. So this is not just, it's not just skin, it's really having an effect on people's lives. And if you put it into context, this is also research that was done during a conflict and during a, a siege and, and resulting famine. So at the individual level, even in that type of environment, you're having a big effect on individual people who are affected. We found there is um, some similarities across the eclipse sites. So we found even in Brazil, if you're living more than a few kilometers away from the reference center, then you have poor access to biochemical treatments. Um, there's low awareness of the causes of CL in all of the sites, even in, in Brazil, and there are different beliefs in the different countries. Um, so, for example, in Sri Lanka, it's thought that the, um, the disease is caused by the, um, not by the, the parasite, but by sandfly larvae getting through the skin, going to the lungs, and then to the brain. And um, there's a gender dimension to stigma, so women are much more likely to be severely affected by CL. And we found that it's not just individuals, but whole communities um, may be stigmatized by CL. So in this one um, particular um, community, um, people thought of the community as um, there's lots of CL there and there's a big rubbish dump. And that was all that they thought about this region. I need to hurry up because I'm running out of time. Um, so in Sri Lanka, one of, the, uh, one of the really interesting twists that we had um, was the first case of Sial was, um, it was believed to be in 1992. And um, the parasites there act very differently. So this species of parasite there normally would give you the visceral form of disease. But in Sri Lanka, it causes the cutaneous form, the skin form. And that really doesn't, ex it, it doesn't make sense. How did they evolve so quickly? They suddenly turned up and became something different. And we had um, a PhD student who looked at the, the medical archives in Colombo, and they have, from the colonial times, they wrote everything down, and she found that there were over 33,000 cases of CL um, between um, 1900 and the 1950s. And they were there in the archives, but they'd not been picked up by the scientific community. And we think what happened was that in the 1950s, there was widespread um, spraying with insecticides for malaria control. And that took the, the disease level right down 
and then eventually it came back up again. Um, but in the meantime, the disease was, was forgotten in, in, the, in the country. So the result of this was that we found that CL is not an emerging disease, but it's a re-emerging disease, which actually changed the whole history of the disease in that country, which is quite amazing for a, a student project. So we're now at the stage where we're developing um, eclipse intervention. So this is our second phase. So we, we know there are loads of challenges um, of living with CL, both for the individual and for communities. And um, the team have used um, lots of arts, and they've used videos and um, theatre. We're doing training for healthcare and education professionals. Um, in Sri Lanka and Brazil at the moment. Um, and this is being developed in, in Ethiopia as well. It's very, it will be very challenging to, um, to do the interventions in Ethiopia, but we have, it's probably the place where we can make the most difference because CL at the moment is not, it's not part of the healthcare system. And the aim of the team is to have it at all levels and for all of the healthcare professionals at, from primary right up to tertiary level to know what CL is. Um, and hopefully to inform um, policy and to highlight the need for CL treatment and control, not just in these communities, but also in the academic community um, to get people to work on CL because it's important. Um, we have a, um, in the Brazil team, we have a really strong arts team. And they, uh, they worked with um, eight women in the area that had the, um, the stigmatisation, the, the, where they had the landfill and the people didn't think of anything um, in, the, in the town except CL and, and the rubbish dump. So um, these eight women um, made lots of, of little videos that were put together into a 20 minute film. And it's beautiful. And um, they were asked to, to film parts of their lives and to think about if they had a movie of their life, what would they put in it? Um, it's available on YouTube. Um, it was picked up by a film festival in Argentina. And um, in the town, they had a um, they had a launch for the film, which was fantastic. So they invited um, lots of people, um, lots of policymakers who they could then talk to about CL. Um, so that's been really successful. And it's put the, the town into a, a different light. And the, the women who were in the film were invited to a, um, an academic conference in, in November in Salvador. And it's, it's been really amazing. And then in, um, in Sri Lanka, um, we've used drama. So a form of drama called Kala, um, Kalama, um, where you have um, characters in masks. So the team um, commissioned a mask that had a, a CL lesion on it. And they addressed all of the misinformation um, that they'd found in their qualitative research. So the, the idea that you have the the sandfly larvae going into the skin, they integrated that into the drama and showed that that was not what the disease was and um, encouraged people to, to go towards um, healthcare. So coming back to um, this point here, um, so the knowledge gaps for CL, we're starting to address many of those with the Eclipse programme. So, we still don't know how many people have CL across the globe, but we know that it's more than are reported, um, particularly in Ethiopia. Um, in 2015, there were, I think, 500 cases reported across the entire country. Um, and that's a gross underestimation of how many people have that disease. Um, we're beginning to understand when and how people seek health, health care, what the barriers are to doing that. Um, the groups of people who are most affected, we have lots of data 
on that. And there are, um, we have lots of evidence that CL really is stigmatizing, particularly in Ethiopia. And coming right round in a circle, we also have a project I don't have time to, to talk about, but using social sites to inform the development of new treatments, so not on, on CL, but on visceral leishmaniasis. So this was a, a project with partners in India um, where they interviewed um, people with the disease and healthcare workers to look at what types of treatments would be most acceptable and what were the barriers to accessing treatment for, um, for those people. So we've gone in a, in a full circle. So starting off with drug discovery, going through social sciences, and then using social sciences to inform what we should do with the drug discovery side. What, what do people actually want, and how can we develop that? So to answer these big questions, you need an interdisciplinary team. So you need people with different skills, but not just working in silos, but working together to solve um, problems. Um, these are lots of the, the people that we've met from the Eclipse team, um, and we're hoping to meet lots of the um, Ethiopian team as well soon. Many of them we've only met online. Um, so I'm presenting lots of data that other people have, have, have done. Um, thank you to all the, the funders. So, so although leishmaniasis is neglected, um, we have um, managed to, um, to get funding for, um, from a lot of, of different sources. And just to finish, thank you to lots of people. So um, not just the people who are on the slides here, but um, all my colleagues, all my friends who've helped um, considerably over the last few years. Um, people who've looked after Ed when I've gone away to exotic places. Um, and I have the um, essential photograph of David Attenborough here that <laughs> many people in Kiel have a photograph of themselves with David Attenborough from when he came. Um, and finally, um, thank you to my family. So um, some of them are, are here today. So my three sisters, my mum who's watching online, um, my dad who's sadly not, not with us anymore, um, and my aunts and my cousin who's here as well, um, and nephews and nieces, Chloe's here, and, um, and then to Ed, <laughs> who's, uh, who's been very patient and, and tolerant to the a mad mother. <laughs> so I'll just leave it there. And the last word from um, Brazil. So I think this is the type of quote that you don't get with um, biochemical or um, cell biology research. This was a, a quote from one of our community health workers um, that Eclipse is different from all of the projects here. You don't have a, an attitude of superiority. And for the first time, we felt we were really participating and not just giving our opinion, but acting. And when we saw the results of the videos that we'd made with the, the arts group, we felt powerful. And it was the result of our work. We realized we were able to make that beautiful thing. And we often feel tired of fighting alone without the support of government officials. But now we, find, we feel we can count on you. So that was a really lovely quote to, to have from um, one of the, the community members. And it seemed a, a nice place to, to stop. So thank you all very much for, for coming. <laughs> <laughs>